right. Welcome back to the Signs of the Southland podcast, oh my God. presented by From the Rumble Seat. I am Akshay Schwarn, and joining me today, live from Tampa, Florida, are Jay Grant. Hold on, I gotta kill some alligators. Cade Lawson. Oh God, all of Latin America just shrieked. <laughs> and Ethan Greger. What's up, y'all? I'm not as funny as those two. Uh, we are coming at you tonight on site uh, from this that afternoon's so Georgia Tech <laughs> Georgia Tech football game versus South Florida. Uh, it was it was a rough one. Can you stop with the alligators? There's alligators out there, though. We're in the swamp. Oh God! Uh, it was a rough one, everyone. Uh, but before we get into it. And analyze it a little bit more. Let's talk non-rev sports. Ethan and, and Jake, uh, what you got? Well, I have great news. Illinois just scored a touchdown. <laughs> All right, I think you need to focus on our podcast Sorry. recording. Yes. Sorry, Western Illinois versus Illinois is obviously the best football game on television This right is going to get cut. Just go off. I know. Oh All right, so in the world of non-rev, Ethan, we have good news, right? We do have some good news. Do you want to share some of the good news? I mean, why don't you go ahead with the good news and then I'll follow up with the bad news. All right, I'll take the good news. Well, the good news is we run this stake, quite literally. Oh, God the, uh, damn it. You used that pun. Yes, we talked I about did. this. We did we talk about We talked about that. this. You and I ignored you. using this pun. Oh yeah, I ignored you. That's okay. Uh, but the good news is, in one of their only three regular season, I don't know why, uh, events, the uh, Georgia Tech women's cross-country team upset number 19 Georgia in Athens uh so that's swell and then the men also were at the meet and they both took home the title um Avery Bartlett uh multiple time national appearance dude <laughs> in uh, he's good at the running he's good at, he's good at running clearly I'm good at talking about running but um he uh won the men's uh individual and so it was a good it was a good meet up in the uh school in the cesspool so good times all right, Ethan, what's yeah, up with volleyball? Yeah, over in volleyball. Uh, the Jackets beat Northern Illinois in three sets on Friday, three tight sets in a game that was closer than it probably should have been, and followed that up with <clears throat> losing their first game of the season to Alabama in straight sets, and then coming back today and losing to Marshall in four sets in a weekend that would probably be classified as disappointing for the team only going one and two, even though they're nine and two now in the season. Michaela Dowd missed... <clears throat> The games this weekend, all three games. Yeah, right. I didn't see her on the stats on any of them, but I haven't finished that part of Yellow Jacket around it yet. So. Yeah, and that's a that's a big loss for this team. Dominique Washington stepped up in the win over Northern Illinois. She hadn't played much the first two weekends, but she recorded a double-double with, I believe, 13 kills and 14 digs. Mm-hmm. So it was nice to get some contributions from girls who haven't been contributing very much. But the one and two would certainly be a disappointment this weekend for the Jackets. Yeah, but they did make it to nine wins, and last year they are at 13, and we haven't even hit uh, the 18-game conference schedule yet. So, you know, things are looking up for a really young team. Sam Knapp made it into uh, the yeah, game at least for a little weekend. bit. Yeah, yeah. That's, a, uh, that's good to see. Yeah, she was a libero as a freshman last year, and that means that one of our good core presence is back. So not all is lost on the one and two weekend, yeah. and uh, we're awaiting the results of men's golf when they wrap up. And looking ahead to next weekend, the Jackets are back home to take on UGA in Arkansas. <coughs> Sorry. And then he, with both teams' RPIs in the top 50, you'd really like to see them get a split this weekend in those two. Oh, yeah. Clean old-fashioned hate comes to uh, O'Keefe Gym Friday night at 7 p.m. Uh, be there. It's probably the best game on the flats. But um, Georgia Tech walking away with one of those, I'd, I'd call it a good weekend. I would, too. Yeah, and then on Sam Knapp again, she was just a healthy scratch, it seemed, the last I mean, she, couple of weeks. She's been on the bench. She just hasn't been dressed. So. Yeah, she hasn't had a cast on or anything. I mean, maybe they want Maddie Tippett to get more time against some of these uh, non-conference schools that aren't... This is certainly an interesting way to do that, though. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, I don't know. We've played some close games in which her veteran leadership would help, but, you know... So if she's back, she's back, back, back you know? Yep. Katie Comby uh, was out for, or Cody Comby was out, um, I believe, two games last week, but she came right back. I don't think Michelle A is going to be too uh, not aggressive. She's going she's gonna to play the players that can play. 
Yep. I, I want to say Emily Becker is also starting to work back into the rotation. Yeah, she's been yeah. real solid on defense when I've watched her play, too. Yeah, that, that's good. Um, McKissick's had a couple service aces, and, uh, of course, Mariana Brambilla is the future of this yeah, team. Yeah, she's been outstanding. There'll be a statue of her in front of O'Keefe one day. So looking forward When they to rebuild O'Keefe. They are uh, trying to rebuild By 2020 rebuild with uh, the Athletics Initiative. So we'll support see. that. Yeah. yeah, if you haven't don if you haven't donated already, uh, go do that. It's a link like ramblinrec.com slash twenty twenty. I mean the link's everywhere. Just got I don't know, we'll put it in the show notes. Just we'll, do the we'll do the Google out. thing. You'll yeah, well, you will find it. It's always easier to find something on Google than use Gotex websites. So Oh yeah. Anyways. So you wanna you wanna talk about Tampa? You wanna talk about the University of South Florida? Ah, uh, yeah. This city shouldn't exist. It's hot. Oh boy, it was hot, it was humid, it was disgusting. I'm still fighting off freaking alligators, man. Oh boy, Jake has gone uh, full shutdown full cast on today's live show. But uh, it was hot, it was humid, it was disgusting, it was all sorts of nasty out in... sit next to Akshay. Uh, in Raymond James Stadium in Tampa, Florida today as the Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets took on the South Florida Bulls. Uh, just a brief overview of the stats here. Georgia Tech put up 602 yards of total offense, while USF put up 426 yards of total offense. Uh, Taquan Marshall, 9 of 18, 138 yards passing, one touchdown, two interceptions, 13 carries, uh, one 13 yards rushing and a touchdown. Uh, Kervante Benson uh, limped off the field. I want to say it was sometime in the first quarter uh, with what injury. looked like a leg injury. It was quickly replaced by uh, Jordan Mason, who put up 13 carries and 95 yards. So that was a nice game for him. Uh, Clinton Lynch got back into the mix, had three receptions, totaling 111 yards. That is a really good line that no, I did not see before. One of it came on one play. Okay, yeah, for well, that touchdown, right? For Tawan, yeah. second quarter. Okay, well, you know, it's a really good line. We had, we had a lot of guys going down from that injury bug uh, across the offense. Yeah. That, that, it was their a, numbers were kind of gaudy, not going to lie to you. Yeah, and uh, in addition to that injury bug that we were already talking about, Jaysia Lee... Uh, was injured for a wee bit, but he got back in after a couple plays. Um, looked like he had a leg injury, but then was able to walk it off uh, and come back in. And then the biggest injury of all, I think, on the offensive side of the ball was Taquan Marshall got knocked out with a leg injury for a couple plays. I think it was sometime during the third quarter. Uh, and Tobias Oliver comes in, puts up 21 points, and... Uh, then once Marshall is cleared for play again, uh, Marshall goes back in, converts on a third and nine, uh, but then the rest of the game is kind of kind of rough. Uh, USF, on the other hand, they were able to convert six of 11 on third downs. Blake Barnett, pretty good stat line, if we're talking objectively. 21 of 31 passing, uh, 202 yards, two touchdowns, one pick. Uh, 16 carries, 91 yards rushing, and two touchdowns. Uh, USF's running back, Bell, 12 carries, 69 yards. Yeah. Nice. Uh, and a tud, and a tutty. Uh, Tyree McCants, who we were all afraid of uh, when previewing this game earlier in the year. Time out, time out. Is a tutty a thing? <laughs> yes. I don't think that's <laughs> it's a, thing a thing that people use. A tutty is a thing. What is that's what, you, that's what I used to sleep with. Oh, I was like five that's years old. That's a teddy. <laughs> that's a different. Oh, oh. Jesus Christ. Okay. Anyway, Tyree McCants, 10, 10 receptions, 99 yards, and uh, our now worst enemy from USF, Terrence the lady Horn. The that behind us? Oh, boy. Oh, boy. We have another story to tell about that. Maybe guys, if we get to. Down in front of us? Down in front. <laughs> down in front. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, but our now worst enemy on the on USF with two kickoff return touchdowns and a receiving touchdown, Terrence Horn. Oh boy. Okay, let's uh, let's start by talking about the offense. What what did y'all think? 
it's hard to call it a bad offensive performance when you put up 602 total yards. Um, the thing that really gave away the game was something we'll talk about later on, I'm sure, with the special teams. But um, the offense was really hit or miss, despite the fact that they put up 602 yards. Um, especially because you started off with a really hot start from Taquan Marshall, which eventually cooled off with his injury. Uh, and then in came Tobias Oliver, who had a really, really, really strong third quarter, and he was pulled again for what we assume was an injured Taquan Marshall, and that went extremely poorly. So overall, the offense played really well, but it's hard to say that the right decision was made to pull Taquan Marshall, or to pull uh, Tobias Oliver in favor of Taquan Marshall in his injured state later on. Yeah, I think <clears throat> while it was tough for uh, Coach Paul to pull Tobias when he was playing so well, when Tobias was in the game in the third quarter, they had simplified the playbook down to where they were really only calling your quarterback follow, your inside veer, your rocket toss, really you yeah, know, basic very, plays in our offense. It was a very, very simple playbook. Yeah, it was very, very simple. But it was working. And it was so it surprising was that yeah. it was working. I mean, the quarterback follow – they took straight down the field six or seven times and rode yeah. for one touchdown in the third quarter. And then they got away from that a little bit in the fourth quarter. And they put Marshall back in for a few plays. And then USF got ahead. And then Paul needed to open up the playbook to throw the ball a little bit and, you know, do a few different things running the ball that they had, you know, worked on with Tobias as much because he hasn't had as much experience in this offense. So at that point, I don't hate the decision to leave Taquan in. You got to assume that he got healthy and they decided to put him back in. Well, he made that but, pass on third and nine. Yeah, he did make the pass on third and nine. And for all the time Tobias Oliver spent in the game today, he did not attempt a single pass. See, so you've got to think that the coaching staff just doesn't have the confidence in him to throw the ball right now that they have in Taquan. Say what you will about the uh, backup, but backup, center, backup, B back, and backup quarterback were gelling in the third quarter with those three touchdowns once Jit. Once the, the went down. Definitely there. Yeah. So could be worse. Yep. Yeah, I think definitely Jordan Mason and Tobias Oliver, their their stock went up today. Uh, yeah. I don't think it's a big stretch to say that Oliver might get a start next week. They're both redshirt freshmen, don't forget. We've yeah. got three more years of each of them on this team. Yeah. I, yeah three I, more three more full years. Yeah. I'd be shocked if we saw Tobias Oliver get a start next week, especially since we saw how Regretlessly, <laughs> Paul, John, Paul Johnson went back to him um, and, and watched him kind of struggle for, or watched the offense as in general kind of struggle for the end of the game. So I doubt we'll see Tobias Oliver in a starting capacity, but hopefully we see him in, in a, maybe a few series throughout that game. But I think that uh, Tobias Oliver coming in during that third quarter, it, it ended up being exactly what Tech needed to head, head back into that game. He, like he was he, just a shot of adrenaline. He right left to the that game offense. up 38-28, uh, so yeah. really yeah. something was working. Did, I mean, that was 21, basically 21 unanswered points. I, I, could, I, I could see them using him in kind of a goal line red zone situation, kind of how they did with Tim Barley a ah. few years back and Matthew Jordan one year or two, I believe. Yeah. I could see when they get down to the red zone, putting Oliver in there, running your quarterback follow and your inside veer because – He's proved rather deadly on those plays, but not in the, you know, moving from the 20 to the other 20 that Taquan has shown the ability to do. Yeah, and, and yeah. those, and the QB follow, and the way that Tobias Oliver ran the offense for those couple series, it really did remind me of of 2014 and how fast that offense could move and how it, how it works when everything is, when the machine is really clicking. Mm-hmm. Just running that same play, exploiting yeah, that weakness because they're not making that adjustment. I mean, Paul Paul has been wanting to run the exact same play over and over and over again until it stops working, and then only make a change. Yeah. So I don't say it, that's exactly what he did here. There so. are a couple times in this game where he did that, and the plays really stopped working though. So that that's a coaching issue more than a than Taquan or Tobias not executing on a certain play. Yeah, well. yeah, I think one example of him, even just specifically today, going with the play over and over and over until it stops working was the counter option they kept calling in the first quarter with Daquan. And they had some success moving the ball with it. I think they got stuffed a couple times in a row on it. And it was when they got stuffed a couple times in a row on it that they came back out on their next drive. And the first play, they showed the motion to start the counter option, and Daquan turned around as if he was going to run the counter. 
And then Clinton Lynch floated out the back end for an 81-yard touchdown catch. That at the time seemed like well, a there you go. changing play. That yeah. seemed like the game right there. Like, yeah. You know, just... yeah, I'm just I'm really struggling still with the decision to take Tobias Oliver out after how well he did in the third quarter. I mean, you put up 17 total in the first half and then 21 immediately in that third quarter. And then all of a sudden you just pull him and, and go back to a guy who you saw limp off the field earlier. And all that momentum kind of disappears. I get that he was facing a third and nine and hasn't thrown a pass in his college career yet, but uh, it's, I mean, if you're going to consider facing any third and long situation as like a struggle or a bad play, then you're going to have a really hard time ever having the quarterback who plays more than a series because it's a normal situation to have to face third and long once in a while. So I don't think it's fair to say that he was ever started struggling or what they started doing with him stopped working. Um, and I wish we could have seen what he had done for the rest of the game. But it's also important to note that the Jackets were having trouble converting on third down the entire game. Yeah. Uh, the other stat we have here is three for 12 for the entire game. It's not as well. Part and of that was the distances they had. I mean, they were third always short. third and long. Yeah. Like, this offense works best when it's third and manageable, but Jesus, it was always third and six, third and eight, third and nine. I think it was there's a t- third and 25 or tw- third and 29 mixed in there. Something in there, yeah. Came off of a chop block penalty. Yep. There were penalties. a lot of penalties. Penalties were game. also killer yeah, I think we got in this for game. Eight penalties, five in the first half. And there were all, a lot of offensive penalties that just and a lot things, of defensive penalties. Things that took you away were, second and long, third and long, and all of a sudden USF's got another shot, and then they yeah. take advantage of it. And and these are things that you really thought after Alcorn State and getting some of these penalties, you thought these would be cleaned up. Like the there was one false start, I think, to start off the game. And yeah. Then, uh, there were a couple of well, the, and and we'll talk about on defense. There were a couple of offsides. There were those are just mental errors. There were a lot of just mental errors, and there, there was one you could see. I believe it was they were driving towards our left, right. So the guy all the way on the left side of the formation, he literally just ran right through it, and he was on offense. Like that's just, yeah, just that's a tough play to make. You lose ten yards off of that, and yep. it makes it that much harder to put the ball in the end zone at the end. Of it. They could have been the Falcons. I think the Falcons got 16 penalties or something like that in their game. That was atrocious. But we're doing pretty well. Those refs were just testing to see if their little yellow beanies worked in the game. I think they <laughs> oh my God. Gravity yeah. had not been turned off for that game. They were still getting ground. Yeah. All right. So let's let's talk about the defense a little bit. This, oh, my God. Everyone's stock had to have gone down after this game. I think we can all agree on that. Yeah. We were good the first couple drives. The first, <laughs> the first drive looked amazing. Tariq Carpenter, that interception, it was the great. first drive, and and I think we, we all had this conversation. At least I know uh, Ethan and I did in the stands. We were like, "Well, if this game would be, you know, like fourteen zero or like seven zero, if we didn't give uh, USF the ball back on kick returns, because yeah. our defense early on was doing fine." Like and, and, and like you said, they were doing excellent with Tariq Carpenter's with his pick. Well, but he was out stops. on the second drive for the rest of the game with that targeting call. And so two targeting calls, like you said, Tariq Carpenter's at the beginning of the game, and then David Curry sometime in third the second quarter. half. So he'll yeah. miss the first half of the pick game next week. Uh, and, and Paul Johnson mentioned in the post game that uh, Caleb, did Caleb come off the two thirty a.m. flight? It was yeah, Caleb yeah, Oliver. Caleb Oliver came off a two thirty a.m. flight, missing missing the lay, coming from a family thing like that. That's hard when three of your guys and guess who he backs periods. up? Tariq Carpenter. Exactly. That's like losing two at once. Uh, Sounds like an airline conspiracy, actually. <laughs> Delta <laughs> Airlines, man. Maybe Delta hates the Jackets. I think that warrants some more investigation. They do sponsor the Bulldogs, so go figure. Oh, God. All right. Well, in other news, open field tackling was bad. I, I, there's no way to put that. No way to put that gently. That was just, it was just bad. Third down defense was atrocious. Blake Barnett was really able to carve through this defense. He could do whatever he wanted. He did whatever he wanted. There there was a a little pressure and he got sacked like one or two times, but not like not a lot. Their running back was, I mean, he averaged like five point seven yards per carry every time. Every yeah, time he touched it wasn't the ball, exotic stuff. It was yeah. zone read. It was zone read. It was, it was runs up the down. middle. Yeah. It was draws up the middle. They carved us right through the middle. And I, 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 but I do want to give a little bit of credit where it is due. 
uh, Tech's secondary and Tech's uh, linebackers did do a good job of limiting yards per catch. But when mm. you're missing open field tackles on screens and you're – and there were just a lot of yeah, alignment I, issues. I, I like not really, think they did a good job of limiting the yards after catch. Really? No. Nope. I thought the tackling on screens was awful. I think a little bit of it was Woody's uh, formations. And he was trotting out on defense against the overloaded sets that USF was running to get three or four receivers on the same side yeah, of the field. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, the secondary tackling has to be better. Yeah. They, they, overall, I mean, this is just a bad outing for well, Nate Woody's defense. Where would you say the uh, targeting comes from? The weird rugby tackling not so, being executed, right? Yeah, if, so, if it's all tackling, then it kind of seems like it's hitting at the same So, yeah, problem. so what uh, on the replays it looked like – what Tech was trying to do is do those rugby style tackles where they lead with the shoulder and like a lower bo- uh, lower center of mass and try to come in as, I mean, come in even with that as hard as they could and wrap up, but it, it, it just ended up bleeding with the head. It looked like a, it looked like a team wide issue of not being taught proper tackling form and technique that yeah. goes back to the coaching staff and the fact that they're not teaching guys to wrap up. And they're not teaching guys to lead with their shoulder because you're going to get the targeting calls when you lead with your head, and you're going to miss you're going to miss tackles when you lead with your arms, and that's what the corners were doing so frequently on the screen passes that USF was calling. A couple times we had them at the laces, and then they would just get right out of the right out of the enclosing arms, and they get four. And, four, and, four and a couple of times, lazy. and a couple of times it was a, it was the USF receiver was right in front of the corner, and yep. the corner was gunning for him, and it was. It was just a simple sidestep. It's just lazy. Yeah. It's lazy defense. And and you know, just to just to clarify, we we always try to be as positive as possible on our in our podcasts and in what we write. But it well, was I'm a shill. And and Jake is a shill. That's a given. But like it was just not a good outing for Nate Woody's defense. And, no. and like I, there's no way to put it gently. No, I want to go back really quick to their inability to control or contain Blake Barnett. Uh, that's a holdover issue from Ted Roof's defensive years where you just could not stop any resemblance of a dual-threat quarterback. I mean, you didn't even have to be a dual-threat quarterback. You could still run for first downs against you. And that was something that I was really, really hoping would be fixed this year. But even against a guy who is definitely not a statue, but he's not the most mobile guy in the world in Blake Barnett, um, he just – made everything happen with his legs and had absolutely no resistance on any of those types the, of runs. The thing is, is OL, his offensive line got a lot of push on our defensive line. They were able to keep them contained and then open up pass or open up running lanes for Barnett in the pocket whenever he needed he wanted to draw or he wanted to run his own read and uh, tuck it himself. Yeah, frequently the problem was our Jack linebackers and Vic Alexander and Jaquan Henderson and our defensive ends opposite the Jack. I think it was normally Saying no more, I'm not sure who else yeah. was over there. But <clears throat> they were not big enough to physically handle the tackles lined up across from them. Yep. So as a result, they were trying to speed rush around the edge. And when they would do that, Barnett would just step up into the pocket and take the two of them straight out of the play. And so then what you've got is you've got either three offensive linemen blocking two defensive tackles or one defensive tackle and the other defensive end. Or four if you're counting a running back or a tight end who may also be in the play blocking. And with the coverage as Tech was running in behind him, which seemed like, you know, straight man, man free with two guys deep, the middle of the field would just clear out and you'd Barnett would scramble for 10 or 15 yards before Tech was defender ridiculous. got near him. It would happen so many times yeah. during I this mean, game. I mean, Henri did a good job getting around, but then if it's you can't make a disciplined if, pass rush. Yeah, if you can't, if you can't make a, a play make a on sack. the quarterback, then you just take two of your 11 guys. And if you do it every play, play they're just going to adjust and Barnett's going to keep stepping up. It's just not disciplined pass rush that Nate Woody and his defensive line coach have been teaching these guys. Yep. And I hope, at least. And that whole, like you're saying, that whole, there's probably like five or six yards right through the center of the defense. That's just completely empty. And that's a function of poor coverage. And I think, you know, what they should have adjusted and done as early in the game as the second or third drive once Barnett had started scrambling was put either Curry while he was still in the game or Brant Mitchell as a spy on Barnett. And while they weren't blitzing, their sole responsibility was keeping Barnett in the pocket because it would have made it a lot easier for the secondary behind him knowing that Barnett was not going to scramble, <coughs> or if he did scramble, not scramble very far, and they could focus on guarding their man instead of 
you know, eyes in the backfield where they could get burned over the top. Yep. I did notice something a little interesting that Tech was actually rushing for a lot. They they had three, usually three down linemen, and then they had a fourth guy that was either upright or that was or that was down also. It was almost always the jack. They weren't bringing anybody except the three down linemen and the jack today, from what I saw. The I mean, lack of get, a spy you mentioned earlier is what got me because he was yeah. doing the same thing over and over and over again. Like uh, there were times when it was back to back plays, mm-hmm. and especially when it was short yardage situ- situations, you knew exactly what was probably coming, um, or at least what he would try to do if he didn't have his first few guys in his progression open. Um, yeah, he didn't impress me in his ability to read defenses. Yeah. And if the first option wasn't there, he was just taking over. Yep, and it worked, which is not what you want to see from a new defense. I get that there's all going to be learning curves and everything with this defense, but when when a guy is struggling to make his own reads with his own offensive scheme and you when you should be punishing him, you're actually letting him scramble for first down after first down, you're not doing something very well. I mean, I'd love to be the one to kind of like butt in and say, like, no, you guys are all wrong. But like, we all saw the same game. It's not a it's not a fun one to break down in the aftermath. So, and this uh, the U.S. This is a USF team that lost its entire offense from last season. I mean, this is. I mean, his, their entire offense was Quentin Flowers. From uh, from yeah. like they lost their top receiver and top two running. Two and yeah. three offensive line. That's no. a, 460 yards allowed to an offense. I, even with Blake Barnett being historically a talented quarterback who's made impressive stops in his career but hadn't stuck anywhere quite yet, um, you you should be able to expect probably a better performance than we saw yesterday. Yeah, I think I'd like to hit on one more issue I saw with the defense today, and it was the alignments on the edge of Nate Woody's defense. I think I hit on it a little bit earlier. But, you know, when USF would call their RPOs, when they'd line up in shotgun with one running back and three receivers split out to one side, all too frequently, Tech would only send two corners out to match up with three receivers. I'm not really sure what Nate Woody and his staff saw, because every single time they did that, USF would fake handoff and flip out the screen. And if oh you've my got. Oh, God. It was like what, Miami all It was over honestly again. like it was very Rufian in its ability to not stop screens. And when they would send the third guy out there, they would drop the inside linebackers off of the line of scrimmage, and so then when USF would naturally adjust the RPO and hand the ball off, you know, there's five or seven yards right there easily. If we're talking bad Miami losses, this didn't remind me of last year's Miami loss. It reminded me of two years ago Miami loss. 2016. 2016 at home, where if you don't have ridiculous fumble, scoop and score, back-to-back, Tech wins that game. If you don't have two special teams touchdowns, Tech might win this game. It was the it was the feeling of being so close but still losing by double digits. I and that's that's a tough way to go out. Like And I think someone from the AJC put it best where they described it as a come from ahead loss. Like Tech had a chance to really put this game away with Tobias Oliver at the helm. And he, I mean even with Taquan Marshall at the helm, they convert that third and nine. They're in the red zone, they're in business. And then Quas Cersei, I think it was, fumbles the football uh, no, while running hard. towards while running towards the end zone, and that just kills all momentum. Right when he fumbled that ball, I was having flashbacks to the Tennessee game last year, and JJ Green, another senior A back, fumbling the ball that probably at least helped to lead to a loss in the first big game of the season. In the opposing red zone, too, no less. Mm-hmm. It was definitely a game that yeah. had shades of past losses. Past. Disappointment. One that stands out to me too is at the very, very end of the game. I think it was on a fourth down play that would have given Tech the ball back, although way, way within their own red zone. Um, when USF, I think they actually scored a touchdown on this play where they threw three wide receivers all bunched up to the left, and Tech had for some reason two defensive backs. That's what I was for those yeah. three guys. Mm-hmm. It's like I, I'm, I'm not a mathematician. <laughs> Y'all are the engineers in the room, but um, you're gonna really struggle to stop a guy from completing a pass when it's three on two. And you knew exactly what was coming in that situation too because that's not a formation that you're going to throw out there in a goal line situation on fourth down and then just run it up the middle with three wide receivers out to the left. So you knew what was coming. You didn't do anything to stop what was coming, and you lost. So It wasn't hard to figure out that it was going to be RPO when they came out in that formation. just wanted to comment on one thing. 
I'm not an engineer. Let's get that one straight. Computer oh, something? Computer science. Computer There's science. a different computer word that came after science. I okay. can't remember what they it was. We can't say that one on the air. Can't say that one on the bands, air. 80s bands, Maddie. 80s bands. I don't know where you're going with that one. Maybe you don't read our comment section enough, Akshay. Maybe I don't. And that's a cage job. Kids' cage job to moderate. I just write. Big balls. Yeah, I've got a backlog. Backlog of comments to read. Backlog of comments to read. Backlog. Backlog. Yeah. Backlog. Backlog. Solve that computer. Either way. You can go kill another alligator on the way back. <laughs> well, well. Special problems. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> well, let's yeah. let's move on to special teams then. Well, they were very very special, especially the uh, kickoff coverage unit. Oh boy, were they special. Why did we kick the Terrence Horn twice? Uh, yeah, three times. Uh, three so times, was, and two of them Well, were, one time he just straight up fell down. I mean, he hit the hole, was halfway <laughs> the end zone, and tripped over his own feet. Have a nice trip, see kickoff. you next fall. Yeah. I mean, don't kick to anyone twice in that situation. That, it's not like he was making some crazy athletic play and breaking tackle. He just ran through a giant hole for a touchdown <laughs> twice, <laughs> and twice in a row. So, you, I mean... You just have to wonder what you were thinking. I then, think Ethan and I were telling each other at this point, he just needs to kick the ball out of bounds. Like, just to let him start at the 40. After the second one, like, just nah. let him start at the 40. And the most disheartening part of the kick coverage today versus last year when it was bad, but, you know, not quite this bad where they'd give up two touchdowns and probably should have been a third in one game, was the fact that <coughs> this was the starters. They made it very clear this year in the offseason season that the way they were going to fix special teams was run more starters out there on special teams. So most of the starting secondary and several starting linebackers, including Victor Alexander, David Curry, maybe somebody else too, were all out there on this kick coverage team. So this is the best of the best that we have at tackling and covering, you know, playing defense basically. And they weren't getting the job done. So there's really no other place to turn in terms of personnel. It's, it's a systemic issue that we don't have enough coaches dedicating the time to teaching these guys how to cover kicks and stand. We still lane. don't have a special teams coordinator, do we? So and I way, thought we would pick him up with the 10th assistant, but clearly I was wrong. Yeah, so the way they're handling it is they're assigning one assistant coach to each special teams unit, and they mm. might want to reconsider who they've assigned I, to the kick coach. Yeah, I, I don't necessarily like that approach. No. Uh, maybe, maybe it's a function of this game. Maybe it's just a function of my experience with tech, but... I would much rather like to see a traditional traditional special teams coordinator handle those responsibilities yeah. because I think we've seen other teams complain about this too where in the past where they haven't had a special teams coordinator and they've been absolutely busy on special teams. They get a special teams coordinator or someone who's dedicated to fixing this, their they're right is raining again. Well, it's because it's their job. Their ass is on the line. And I, yep. I mean, it wouldn't fix it instantly to get a, just a special teams coach because we've had them before and it hasn't worked incredibly well, but just... This system, especially just giving assistants that already have big jobs a little thing to add on to the end just relegates the entire role of special teams to kind of an afterthought. And you saw today why it can't be an afterthought, because the second it becomes an afterthought, you allow two touchdowns on two consecutive kickoffs and basically lose yourself. The University of Swamp folk were slippery. They're clearly. Very, clearly. very slippery. I mean, I don't know how they know because they didn't touch them, but... <laughs> well, um, there was... There was a, you know, bright side here. The specialists did, I mean, okay, they did their jobs. It was really just the coverage units that were that were not doing so hot. Presley Harvin had one really good flip in the field, 62-yard punt. From the end zone, from the back of the end zone. From the back of the end zone, and then paired it with a not-so-great 10-yard punt. That was one of the worst punts I've ever seen. Yeah, that was not good. Yeah, that one was not good, boss. see our punt. Coverage team today, but I'm not really sure. I'm excited to see them after watching the kick coverage team. Oh boy! Um, punt saw them have to be called into action. And then uh, Brendan King handled all of the extra points, and he hit all of them, so that's good. And a field goal. And a field goal. Yeah. So I'll take it. Uh, and then Sean Davis handled all the kickoffs. I think what you put mentioned. Put one in the end zone. Put one in the end zone, but that that needs to be a common occurrence, is what you were mentioning, Ethan. Yeah, I mean, if you're gonna be a kicker. For a Power 5 major collegiate team, you've got to do better than 16% of touchbacks on your kickoffs. You've got to be up closer to 40 or maybe even 50. And that's where they've got to get, whether it's with Davis, King, or Wells, or somebody else they bring in. Because you're asking your kick coverage team to do an awful lot 
covering 83% of the kickoffs you you, need to, you attempt. And I think with the new touchback rules, I, I think the new touchback rules will help a little bit, especially now that they can call a touchback. I don't think anybody's going to be calling one when they don't have to against our team after watching the oh, yeah. well, awful, I mean, awful coverage. I mean, right game. now, after watching the tape, I expected I expected Horn to call touchbacks or a call for fair catches on both of those kicks that he ended up returning. Those were pretty deep, and they were yeah they were pretty deep. I mean he started from like the one or the two. One was all the way over in the corner. He's practically out of bounds. Yep. Yeah. And then no, he didn't. He just sat in there. He saw his. He picked his spot. He picked it out and and ran through the hole. So I I think they just need to come back to campus th- this week and. Just drill on that. That is I mean, not. Can I say too? Thank goodness Quadre Henderson is not playing for Pitt oh, yeah. anymore. He would that man is shreds. dangerous. He took a punt back to the house against us last year, and I don't want to know how many touchdowns he would have scored next week if he was still up. <sighs> the real question about next week is what's the over under on heartbreaking game ending field goals? No, he's gone. That's no, Blue, it's gone. And he's he's gone a while now. That's dead to me. No, I remembered that was two years in a row for Chris Blewett breaking my heart. I'll go on record saying Chris Blewett's a meaty head. <laughs> you can quote me on that any day because he was very mean. Strong words from Big Boss K. Lawson. Very strong. He's had a long very day, man. Strong. He's just telling it how it is. Spoken like a true champion uh, of the good word right here. Champion of life? Champion of life. Oh, life we are all Butch Jones on this blessed day. I don't think that makes it a blessed day, Akshay, but that's a different problem. Butch, yeah. if you're listening, please tell us. We want to hear from you. I'm sure. <laughs> Butch, you're if you're listening, please please spread the good word. <laughs> We'd like to have you on the air. You've done some terrible things to Georgia, and for that, we are thankful. That's true. Yeah, that's uh, some terrible things to us too. But that's well, no, 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 no. The uh, the dobnail boot is the one thing I'll give him. That's what they that's what they call the the Dobbs play, right? Really? Yeah, the Dobnail boot, because the Hobnail boot was something that Georgia did against Tennessee. Ah. Something like that. I don't know. I don't really keep up with them. Well, seeing sad dog fans after that <laughs> Tennessee UGA game in 2016 really oh, warmed my heart oh, my after God. the 2016 Miami game, and I've brought our conversation full circle. Akshay, what's up next? 